let's look at the part and uh, kind of let's uh, let me go through kind of what I usually go through when I first look at a part and and what I'm thinking when I'm setting it up now the part is going to come to me well let me let me um, let me this is the way the stocks gonna look it's already machined to this shape with the hole through it the middle and and this end detail work on it because because um, I'm kind of doing part of the job that they used to do on the some of the um, vertical mills here and so this is the way they actually set it up so they have this tail end support piece here and they chuck onto this diameter here and they do the milling on the OD so it's really it, it really isn't necessary for me to do this on the integrex I just got this job because they needed it done and so what I normally look at so this is the stock the, the green is the stock I'm gonna turn off the tail end fixture and this is the way it's going to be provided to me. And now this part is uh, more or less pure copper. So it's, it's copper is kind of soft and gummy, but it's kind of difficult to machine because it, it, uh, it tends to wear out tools. I'm not sure the principle behind that, but it, uh, I'm kind of imagining, even if you use carbide tools or whatever kind of tool, the, the copper kind of welds itself to the tool and it's absolutely necessary to use coolant because of course copper conducts heat so well that the material will get hot and then it, when it gets hot it tends to stick to the tools and then it loads up the tools and you end up breaking tools or um, even turning it is difficult to do without the the proper um, tools and everything and the feeds and speeds have to be right you have to kind of cut it shallow depths of cut you can't get too aggressive even though you could cut it that fast you really can't get that aggressive with it so I'm looking at the finished part here of what I got to do which is basically all this middle section and those two slots along the side I'm not going to do these holes up here they're going to do that afterwards and of course all this on the end was already done so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking how am I going to get in here when I look at a job to get to these features which which it happens to be that this radius up in here is a well it would require a 3 16 end mill at the very largest and this one would require um, eighth inch end mill at the very largest tool and the depth is 860 thousandths from this face to that face and it's about an inch up to here and an inch, more, more or less roughly an inch point four, one point four inches from there up if we have like that, 1.4 inches. So on that side, I'll be able to have to reach in here with the largest tool I could fit, whether it be a 3 16 end mill. Now you could drill these corners out and that's one way to do it. I'm not gonna do it that way, I don't think. And that would probably help a little bit but for me, I, I don't find that that really improves things a tremendous amount. It does a little bit. So I'm looking at that side of the part, and those are the most difficult details on this side. The rest of this is just straight pocketing type of stuff, and these, these little pockets on the side. Now, all the threads on this part are STI threads, which are threads for helicoils. And so I've got to consider that, too, and, and the tooling involved. If I, if I turn this part around, we've got a feature on this side that's similar to the other side, but in a way it's a little bit more difficult because it's a little more crowded in here. But other than that, the rest of this is pretty much the same as the other side. So I, I begin to think what I'm going to need and what tooling I have to do this with and how I can do it. And now, in general, I like to stick to standard tooling if I can possibly do it. I don't, I mean, I do have the capability of, of grinding special tools with my CNC tool and cutter grinder, but I don't really like to do that if I don't have to, because it just takes more time and it costs more than buying a tool off the shelf, in reality, to grind it. 
so what I'm looking at here is uh, these counterboards. Let me cut a section through the part here. Now these threads down at the bottom here are the are STI threads as well and this would require a long shank tap to get down in here. This distance from here to here is almost two inches and the counterbore itself I believe is three three-eighths of an inch 380 thousandths plus or minus 10 I'm gonna drill it with a three-eighths drill so I have to reach down in here and drilling the tap drill hole is not really a problem but getting a tap in here with an STI tap it's kind of difficult to get long shanks on STI taps or decent ones and I don't really intend to tap this all the way to depth in copper because it's a little bit iffy and particularly back down in a counterbore like this so I'm going to just start the thread and then finish these two holes by hand tapping them but I will need an extension for the tap and the standard extension won't fit into this small of a hole so I'm going to make my own I would had a little Instagram post showing this device here but I've done this in the past it's a it's a relatively simple thing to make. You just um, drill and bore a hole to fit the tap nicely on the shank and then you mill a slot in here that matches the um, square on the top of the tap. And then what I usually do is Loctite this in, the tap in the hole, and then if I need to change the tap I can just heat it up and pull the tap out and put a new one in and re-Loctite a new one in. So that I have to modify and I've determined I'm going to use shrink holders, these um, ER32 shrink holders. Uh, the brand I'm going to use is Iskar or ETM brand, but there's different brands. You can buy, I think, Lindex and some other people make them too. And I've had really good success with these shrink holders that just fit into an ER, well, in this case, an ER32 collet, although I think you can get them in ER16, ER20, and 32, and maybe 40 but I predominantly use the ER32 ones because they fit my chucks that I have. And I have to get into these areas and in order not to have a real long end mill with no support the tip of the ER32 um, shrink holder is small enough in diameter I can get down in here for the most part except on this side this distance here is is only a um, an eighth of an inch if I remember right let's see yeah an eighth of an inch from there to there so if I was to go in here with say uh, I plan on finishing this with a 530 seconds end mill and it'll hit the the um, shrink holder so I'm gonna have to also modify the 3 16th shrink holder which this is the model I downloaded from Iskor and I just remodeled the end of it here and I'm going to cut this down on the lathe. So I have to do these little things. I have to um, make these tap extensions. I'm going to make one for the machine and then another one so that I can hand tap to depth when the part is out of the machine. And then I've got to turn down at least one of these shrink holders. I'm going to use other ones that are uh, an eighth inch ones and a um, quarter inch ones for different end mills because I plan to rough in these pockets here with a, um, a .218 or 7.30 seconds carbide end mills and then I'm going to come back and finish it with a 5.30 seconds in these areas where these radiuses and, and stuff are and the rest of these pockets are going to be milled with a quarter inch end mill because this will all fit this is a 260 radius so the quarter inch tool will get in there and it'll get into all of this and these pockets and everything else. So this is kind of the thought process I go through when I first look at a job. I want to try to use standard tooling if I can. And the other little thing I have to do as far as before I actually put the part in the machine is I have to repair this. This center is a little bit dinged up and so I'm going to repair it. I didn't make this fixture end piece. They've used it on other parts. So I, I'm just but they somehow that that center got damaged a little bit and I'm going to repair that 
also before I start. I have to do all these things and think about it before I actually start on the job because I'm working by myself and I don't have other people in the shop that can do these little operations for me while I'm setting up on the other job, the main job. And also I'm going to, um, I've got a set of soft jaws. I'm going to bore them to hold the part like this and, uh, and turn this taper after I bore them on there just for clearance purposes. So, th so this is basically what the setup looks like when it's going to be in the intercracks. It's going to be supported out here at the tail center and in the, on the small three jaw chuck mounted in the, the bigger four jaw chuck to hold the part like this. This, this diameter here is not that critical, but this one is a very close tolerance and finish, so I can't really chuck onto it down here. And it, it really won't be necessary. This is pretty much light milling, so it's not going to be a problem, I don't think. We'll see. So that's the, the fixturing part. Had to think about all of that and order the chaws and and get everything sorted out. This These slots are going to be done with the ball end mill pretty much and this end with a quarter inch end mill. So the, all, the, all the rest of these threads, these all these little holes here are um, 440 and 1032 STI threaded holes and they're going to all be milled. In this copper, I don't really like to tap holes if I can help it because the, the tap tends to grip. It, it, it breaks the tap when it reverses more likely because it kind of grips on the tap and it breaks. And, and uh, also, like I said before, copper tends to wear out tools very quickly. Even though it's soft, it tends to wear them out, even carbide tools. So the, the, um, the idea is to take light depths of cut which on this milling, I'm going to be milling kind of these trochoidal and, and uh, adaptive type of cycles which are cutting with the side of the end mill at full depth of cut in these bigger areas and down in these pockets I'm going to take um, you know pecs down but I'm going to use the same kind of cycles these those uh, adaptive trochoidal type of milling cycles so that's the um, the idea of the plan this is the I've already made one of these extensions and this is this is the simulation for this thing which oop, if I can get it positioned correctly so that's that's the turning then drilling and I'm just gonna mill out the bore for the tap and the end mill and then uh, take a little 3 16 end mill and mill a slot in here. So in the beginning of this video we're going to kind of do all these preparations for getting this done. I have yet to still program and set up the um, For the, to, to turn the shrink holder down, I should say. I'm not going to use this. I, I, I had trouble. I tried to grip this little rod in these chuck jaws, and I'm having these chuck jaws are sprung open, so it's really only gripping back here on the heart, the master jaws, and I need to rebore these chuck jaws, but I don't want to do that right now, so I ended up in the actual setup putting a ER32 collet chuck, and I'm holding this part in a ER32 collet, in the, which is chucked in the master jaws without the top jaws on the chuck on the machine. I need to um, probably I'm going to hard turn these jaws so that they um, are not sprung open. It, w it wasn't gripping this small diameter and normally I don't use the chuck that way so it really isn't a problem for the most part but I ran into that problem with the initial um, part on this this little extension thing. So that's kind of the um, thought process I go through. I kind of try to think how I can do all this with a standard tooling if possible. Now I have to make this extension for the tap because that uh, to go down through this counter bore here 
because it's just not possible to well it's it might be possible to buy a long shank STI tap but I would have to order that special it's not really a standard item to get that and the rest of these threads I can thread with standard thread mills STI thread is standard uh, pitches but it's just bigger in diameter of course for the the heli coil to fit into the hole so that's a brief, um, sort of brief explanation of what's going on here. Now we're going to get to the actual doing of it. All right, here's the tap extension. As, as I mentioned earlier, I changed to that collet chuck because I was having problems with the chuck jaws. I have to turn the end of that down a little bit smaller in diameter so it'll clear that, that 3 8 hole counter bore on above the tapped hole in this case because this is a 3 8 diameter uh, piece of drill rod. Don't really need the pecking cycle there but I, did, I wasn't sure if I was going to use a high speed steel drill or that carbide drill. I just happened to have that carbide drill already set up in the machine. So, oh, so here's the end mill like you saw in the graphics. Milling out to the shank of the tap size. And then uh, come in and mill that um, key slot with the 3 16 carbide end mill. Kind of had to use coolant here so it's kind of hard to see it. I was kind of, I was afraid to run this dry. So that's the tap extension. Like I said, that Loctite the tap in there. I made two of those, one for hand tapping and one for the machine. Here's the heat shrink holder. As I said earlier, I, I don't know if I said, but uh, this is an ISCAR brand or an ETM brand one. I'm turning it here just for clearance on that one side of the part because this would hit the side of the wall only on that side. The rest of it would clear, but I don't want to stick that um, that 530 seconds end mill out too far so in order to shorten up the tool the machine clearance in this to uh, make the tool a little stronger with less projection it's going to have a one inch projection anyway which is kind of sticking out far for a 530 seconds end mill I turned it that way I set it big just to check it and then I just reran the whole program was easier to do that than I could have probably just run the finish cut but it was just easier to run the whole program so you're going to see the roughing cycle all over again here this may have been able to be turned with a, just a standard carbide insert it didn't seem like it was that hard but I had the CBN insert in the cabinet so I it. I don't know if you can hear all that air. These guys are blowing these air nozzles like crazy behind me. I'm doing this voiceover in the shop when they're working over here. It's kind of loud. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to doing this. Just turn some clearance on there. I want it to be a uh, I think it was 385,000, if I remember right. That's the diameter that I figured. To, in the end of the video, you'll see a little bit of graphics that shows why that's necessary. So I got to do all these things to get ready for the job. I try to figure this all out ahead of time. It's better to do it and be ready with it and instead of being in the middle of the setup I can't really pull the part out and go back on this and and see there's the saran I mean the CBN insert that I used can't really read the numbers but the Sumitomo insert then I had to just recut this this center I find in the in the integrex it's easier just to do this with a small end mill and tilt the b-axis at 30 degrees. I 
you could do it with a boring cycle, but I, I didn't have a small boring bar like that to go in there, so I just used this uh, 316 sand mill, or, um, or maybe it was a 730 seconds, I can't remember, it might have been a 730 seconds. And just tipped the B axis at, at 30 degrees, and then I just rotated it with the jog, the handle jog, the C axis. Just to clean it up, it, it was didn't take hardly anything. Just to clean up a few dings. Oh, the reason the tapes on the end of the part or the end of this fixture is there's a somebody engraved a part number there, and I can't really show that in the video. Or this customer makes me take the videos down if I show a part number or anything like that. So I didn't want to have that problem. Here's boring the chuck jaws. I had this piece of short piece of pipe. I found and I kind of modified one end of it and I manually cut that notch in the chuck jaws with the, um, one of the tools in the machine so I could chuck with this ring. It, it's important to um, put the force out on the end of the jaws with long jaws like this so it springs the whole thing open with the chucking force you're going to use if you put a you know like a slug back which I could have in this case put a slug back in the back end of the jaws it doesn't put the same force on the jaws and you don't get the proper um, taper if you will to the bore when the jaws are relaxed so it's better to put all of the force out on the front of the jaws like I'm doing here I'm just using this this small carbide bar. It's a 5/8 carbide bar to bore the jaws with. You'll see when I'm finished. I pull that ring off, and you can see I kind of cut a angle groove with a 35 degree diamond tool into the face of the jaws. That's all going to be machined away later anyway, so it doesn't matter in this case. Now I have done this before too with putting three pin, a pin in each one of the screw holes in the jaws and grabbing onto a ring like this, but it, it just didn't work out good for this, where the, where the holes were located for this ring, so I just machined the ring a little bit so that it wasn't so wide on the end of it that's chucked in the jaws there. And this works pretty good. I need to make something that I can adjust, like maybe in my plasma cutter I could cut a disc with some, some kind of um, spiral grooves that could engage on pins in the chuck jaws. Be a little bit nicer setup. So here I'm going to take the ring off of there and you can see how I cut the groove in the jaws and it kind of matched the ring a little bit. The, one of the parts just chucking onto it lightly until I bring the tail center up there. There's that end piece fixture that actually somebody else in the shop made. I didn't make that. I'm going to bring the steady rest up. I might, in reality, when I really machine these, take that steady rest off of the mount. It, it doesn't really get in the way, but it might be better just not to have it there to begin with. That's the manual steady rest I made quite a long time ago for a specific job, but it's come in handy for other jobs as well now. Then I'm going to move the tail center up. Now, in the actual running of the job, I won't be moving the tail center body in and out. I'll just use the quill in the tail center to um, extend it out and, and uh, engage the center in the aluminum fixture piece. And I just want to put all this up here mostly so I can turn, finish turning the outside of the jaws. Like I say, I might, I probably will pull this piece out of, out of the machine before I line up on it very carefully and uh, 
take that steady rest off of the mount, it just gives me more clearance around the whole job. Even though it's not, I think it would clear, everything would clear with that in there, but just in case. So here's the, the train of the OD of the Chuck Jaws. Now I still have a few things to do to actually totally set this up. I've got to grind the shanks down on some of the end mills that I'm going to be using on, in those shrink holders. But I'm going to use standard end mills, but I'm just going to grind clearance in the shanks. And that, that really is pretty easy to do on my uh, grinder. I don't mind doing that. I don't really want to grind a bunch of special end mills because it just takes too much time to do that and they wouldn't have any coatings on them or anything unless I sent them to be coated so that would even take more time and expense for that so I'm just going to take standard end mills and grind some clearances on the shanks that I need which only takes a, a minute or so on, on the tool and cutter grinder once it's set up and I can just grind like I don't know 10 end mills and have them ready So that, the purpose of this turning the OD of the jaws is just for clearance on the tool holders coming in to mill the various things on the part just in case I don't want to run into those jaws. And I can pretty much just dedicate this set of jaws to this job if it ever comes back again. The jaws are relatively inexpensive, these aluminum jaws. That's, that's um, you know, turning and, and deburring the jaws there. So the next video clip is, it just shows a little bit of the graphics and I want to show this at the end just to show why I need that clearance on the shrink holder. As I cut a section through the part and if you get a side view on this, you see when it goes down into that lower pocket you can kind of see how it would hit the shank and this would only happen on the one end the other end of the our side of the part it wouldn't uh, be a problem but with that eighth inch step on the wall it would it would run into the part there's a little bit of milling those side slots I'm just gonna do with ball end mills like that so the next video we're gonna do uh, the machining part of this